Welcome back. In the spirit of we all need a great summer read, I am thrilled to introduce you to Barbara Kershon, who is the author of Innovate Hers, innovators with an H in the middle. And it's probably not going to be your light beachy uh, romantic rom-com, but I think you're going to love this one. The story, the stories in the book are about real women living real life, doing amazing things, innovating in our world. Why purpose-driven entrepreneurial women rise to the top. And I know you're going to love hearing from Barbara. So here she is. Barbara, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Oh, it's a pleasure. So tell us a little bit about what got you here to the writing of the book, and then we'll talk about the book. Well, I, my background is varied. I've been an investment banker. I've been an academic professor. I've been a teacher and an entrepreneur. And for the last 10 years at the University of Pennsylvania, I was doing research on the entrepreneurial mindset of entrepreneurs. And I really loved what I was learning, but I was tired of writing academic books and I wanted to tell the stories of the people that I had met and researched over the years. So the book is based on that research, but we looked at the, the data and we realized that there were some trends that were quite interesting that affected women. And I'll share those in a minute. But what happened was we decided that we would interview women that had taken our profile and find out what their story was and use the data to look at the stories, kind of in the vein of a Malcolm Gladwell or an Adam Grant. So they do probably are best at this. They take the data, but the reason you listen or read Malcolm Gladwell's books is because of the stories he tells. Absolutely. And so with that in mind, what are some of your favorite stories and how did you use this data to actually bring the stories forward? Well, I my favorite stories, there's a couple of them. I love them all, clearly. <laughs> there's three or four of them that I usually read from when I'm doing a book presentation, but I'll tell you a summary of them. One is this amazing woman who was the head of the Calvert Foundation, Calvert Fund in Washington, DC, which funded uh, underserved communities and with grants and with funding, equity funding. And she tells the story of how she always was brought up wanting to do well and do good, which then became the theme of the book. We wanted to find out what women were doing where they could do well and do good. And she talks about being lucky to get her first job as a banker. She was a Wharton undergrad and a Harvard MBA. And she got this first job and it was a job funding low income housing. And she said she doesn't know how she fell into it, but she learned in that job to do well and do good. And she went on to continue to do that in her life. And she now runs one of the largest social impact funds in the world. Um, so that's one story I really like. The other story that's probably fascinating to me is a woman that's in Tanzania and started a company called Ubanga. And I met Nisha when she came through the incubator that I ran at the University of Pennsylvania and was doing research. And she runs what I call the Sesame Street of Africa. She went over there and realized that she could do animation less expensive and build these programs to meet the needs of these kids that had no literacy in their homes. And she now is the largest TV provider of shows for children in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, wow. she, and she did it in 10 years and she got to Tanzania, interestingly enough, because a professor from her professor at Yale, who was a documentary filmmaker, asked her if she'd go over with her to do this film. And that's how she ended up there and finding out that there was a sort of underground animation group of people doing animation in Tanzania. Unbelievable. So what did you find in these stories that that these women had in common like because like there's always a common thread right exactly well three things we found that were fascinating and, and was and became the common thread throughout the book and one surprising thing we found first of all that women 
are, as all entrepreneurs are, whether they're an entrepreneur in an organization or starting a business, they're risk takers. If you're not a risk taker, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur. But what we found out in looking at the data that women are much more thoughtful or careful risk takers. They do look at the data, they examine the situation. So they make more, I think, appropriate decisions. They don't take any more time, but they're more thoughtful about their decision. They're usually pretty good decision makers. Um, and do take risks. The second thing we learned is one that I have, and we, we probably could do a whole show on this, but we found out that women have very high self-confidence, which all entrepreneurs again have. But the factor that we found out that was most interesting is every single woman in our book said at some point in their career or their journey, they felt like they were an imposter, the imposter syndrome, that they were not qualified to be at the table or that they weren't as good as the other people, even though they were the woman that made it to the top. And they were probably twice as good and they knew they were than anybody else sitting in the room, but they at some time held this imposter syndrome. And I, and in the book, I tell their stories, but I tell my own story of feeling the imposter syndrome. And then the third thing, which I really like also, is that women have higher empathy scales, which again, you would expect. But the interesting thing was how that affected their entrepreneurial journeys. Three things came out of it. One, they were much more, they were more collaborative in working with their teams. Their teams stayed with them longer. And the third one was kind of counterintuitive, but they were able to fire people effectively, more effectively and with empathy. So they didn't fire people because they needed the change. They always positioned that maybe this wasn't the right position and maybe you do need to move on and we'll help you. And I hear that story over and over again. So those were the three themes. And in the stories we tell them, we connected the themes, not by having a chapter on data, but by running each chapter around these themes and telling the stories of how they related to the themes. But we do provide a lot of data about women and where they are in, in being entrepreneurs, how much money they raise more. You know, they return more venture money than male entrepreneurs. They take a little longer, but they return more. Okay. And so it's, it's amazing. I think people don't necessarily think of women in this entrepreneurial spirit. We know there are men and women entrepreneurs out there doing great work, but you don't often hear the stories about the women. And so the opportunity to tell them is really extraordinary. And I'm so grateful to you for doing it. The book is, is newly launched. You're, you're just out three weeks now. And so I feel like we're a, a, a hot off the presses kind of announcement. So share a little bit more about what you what our readers are going to find inside, because I know summer is a big reading season and people are looking for something new and fresh. Well, the nice thing about this book is you can pick it up and read a story or two stories and put it down and you don't have to read it in any order the, the, you can pick up the stories that are most interesting to you. Um, one of the surprises we found, which I love and came up many times, was that women are high on their scale to need to achieve. They're often the firstborn in the family. They're often the person that was the leader. They took care of lots of brothers and sisters, even when, and particularly a lot of our women, they're global, they're all ages. And a lot of them grew up in, in not very, uh, you know, me, not middle-class homes. They grew up in poor homes. And there's a story of one woman that her mom moved to, took her to Hawaii and lived, put her in a commune to live. And then her mother dies when she's 11 or 12, and she then basically takes care of herself and doesn't find an aunt because the mother never talked about her until she's almost out of high school and moves to Chicago, puts herself through college, gets her MBA, um, was the head of education at Lego for a long time. So, um, so we have lots of stories, but the need to achieve is very high. But interestingly enough, and when we profiled the women and we asked them to pick their strengths and weaknesses, nobody picked need to achieve as a strength. They didn't see that. They just assumed that that was part of their personality and they had to do that. And that's what helped them rise to the top. That's incredible. And to your point, a lot of my uh, executive coaching clients, my, the women, like you say, they've started with a, a net negative. 
mm-hmm. and and that need to achieve or that desire to find their way out of their situation and the belief that they can. Mm-hmm. So that I do you find um, it was a was there an age difference between them? Was there a distinction across you know their ages that they had more or less belief in themselves? Is it a generational topic? What do you think? I don't think we saw, surprisingly, we did not see a lot of differences in age or global distribution or diversity. The book has a diverse group of women from around the world, but also Latino, Indian, uh, black women in the book. They were very similar. What we did see in their need to achieve though, was that younger women who even were successful, there was a woman from, that came over on her own from China, got stayed here after she came in a program and got herself through school. And at 26, she's now running a pretty significant startup, um, just raised a, a significant amount of money for it. And she's only 26. Her need to achieve is probably more driven than the older woman that had a more a slower journey to the rise to the top. We have one woman from Canada who was, she said something very interesting that she she was the chief of protocol for Trudeau. She just recently retired from public service. And she said, and one of her jobs along the way was to train all the ambassadors going to different countries. And she said that she, one of the things she taught them was that women have to be able to change on the fly to, to meet the needs of what they're doing. And particularly as an ambassador. And, can, and Canada has a significant number of women ambassadors. Mm-hmm. So we also recorded, the other thing that I found quite funny was we also recorded our interviews and then we wrote the stories up and we returned the stories to the women to approve. We didn't want to say anything that they wouldn't want us to say. Surprisingly, there were things that we had literally quoted and they would say, I didn't say that, that's not me. And we would go back and say, well, here's what you said, maybe we positioned it wrong, but most cases we didn't, it was not their perception of themselves. And we had a, a the, Ses- the president of Sesame Street is one of the women we interviewed, Sherry Weston. And Sherry was, when she read her story, she said, I love this story, but I, you can't publish it this way. She said, somebody will read this out of context, whether it was good or bad statement, and, and I get picked up by the New York Times or people are you know constantly thinking. And so we work, and you are probably very familiar with helping people with their images, but we worked very hard, went back with her and said, well, tell us how you want us to say it. Turns out that when we rewrote the story with her help, it wasn't that far different from the story we had told. <laughs> it just felt better. And sometimes it's very subtle changes. This is the same thing I tell my clients, right? We may change your eyeglasses. We may change something really, really simple that you feel like, wait a minute, what? A word here or there, it just lands differently, doesn't it? And especially if these women are in the public eye already, I certainly appreciate the fact that they want to make sure the story is told in a way that their public will receive appropriately. So I'm grateful to you for making sure that the stories showed up that way. And I'm sure they are too. So where can our viewers find the book now? The book is sold on Amazon, Barron's and Book Club. Um, I think it's called Book Club, but it's on our website, www.innovatehers.org. You can click to order right directly. Amazon right now is ordering a special for Prime members to download the Kindle version with free. So um, that runs for a few more weeks and uh, we would love for people to buy it. And it's a great gift for daughters, for Mother's Day and for Father's Day. (laughs) I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. And in general, just a great read. You don't need an excuse to pick up a great book that's going to give you insights. And and I, for one, learn from other people's stories all the time. This This is the greatest source of education for me. So I'm looking forward to digging in. And thank you so much for sharing with us. And I hope our viewers will run out and get the book. We will put the website and all the information on the screen and also in the blog on our gooddayorangecounty.com. There you go. Nice, colorful uh, book with a great image on the cover. And you can see how it's spelled so you know how to find it. Thank you for joining us, Barbara Kershon. We'll see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
and we'll be right back. <laughs> 